Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to, to tell you a little bit about shimming. So if we look at a typical MRS protocol, it uh, you know, consists of a few steps. Uh, you place a subject in, uh, you make some scout images, then you typically place your volume, your size and position. Then you do uh, some optimization of the acquisition. Then you acquire the data and then you can process the data. Now, I think all of these areas are going to be covered during these few days. I'm going to talk about this kind of black box optimization of data uh, acquisition and what can, that can entail quite a number of things. It can entail RF pulse calibration, if you have at higher field, make your RF more homogeneous, uh, shimming, B0 field homogenization, water suppression and outer volume suppression. And very often, especially on like a clinical scan, and these are kind of like a, in, in a black box, the user doesn't really know what's happening behind the scenes, so I hope I can, I can tell you a little bit more about this. And I'm going to focus on the shimming, the, making the B0 field more homogeneous. So let's first uh, talk about a little bit why is the magnetic field inhomogeneous to begin with? Well, it could be that the magnet is not perfect. Of course, you know, if you have an infinitely long solenoid, that will be perfectly homogeneous, but it has a finite length. There can also be winding errors. You have to insert a patient bed, you have to insert gradient coils and other kinds of coils, and they all disturb the magnetic field a little bit. It can be fairly strong, but they're typically constant. So these are typically not the inhomogeneity that we worry about. The one that we typically deal with every day are the inhomogeneities induced by the patient itself. Uh, they're caused by air tissue susceptibility boundaries, and I'll explain in the next slide what that means. You can also have respiration and movement or implants, all very important areas, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just going to talk about this one, which is really the one that we deal with every day. So what does that mean? Now let's say that we generate a B0 field, let's say three Tesla in a vacuum. Then you have all the magnetic field lines, they're perfectly parallel, indicating it is a homogeneous magnetic field. If we now make that same magnetic field in a different material, you could have the scenario where the magnetic field lines like concentrate or dilute a little bit, making it a little bit stronger or a little bit less strong. And that is related by the magnetic field in a material, is related to the magnetic field in a vacuum, scaled by the magnetic susceptibility. Now that number, that can be smaller than zero, and if that's the case, then we're talking about a diamagnetic material, and water is one of the examples, and that makes the magnetic field slightly lower, so it will be three Tesla minus a very little bit. If the number is greater than zero, it's a paramagnetic material, air, you have three, three Tesla plus a little bit, and if the number is much, much greater than zero, then it's a ferromagnetic material, and we're not going to talk about that, it's generally not MR compatible. Now what now if we have a situation like this, that we have a magnetic field in, for instance, uh, air, and then we have another, another uh, um, um, a sphere of a different material, which then you know, like concentrates the field lines. You can see here the magnetic field is perfectly homogeneous, here the magnetic field is perfectly homogeneous. Now we know that magnetic field lines need to be continuous. So the only way to connect the field lines outside the phantom with the field lines inside the phantom is like this. So these show, as you can see here, if you have a magnetic uh, um, a material with a certain susceptibility and another material with another magnetic susceptibility, then that automatically leads to an inhomogeneous magnetic field. So that's where that term comes from. You have a magnetic susceptibility boundary, and around that boundary, you automatically generate an inhomogeneous magnetic field. Now, we can also show that in a different way. Let's say that we generate a magnetic field in air. Then it will be perfectly homogeneous. If we then put a sphere in with water, which is slightly diamagnetic, then that disturbs the magnetic field outside the sphere. The geometry, being a sphere, makes the homogene homogeneity inside the sphere still homogeneous. But if you now place a little ball of air inside this water sphere, then you can see also the magnetic field inside the sphere is disturbed as well. Now you may say, this is highly artificial, we never see this scenario in vivo, but the reality is actually that you do see this very often, because we can see the, the human head as being kind of a sphere of water, whereas the nasal cavity is a little sphere of air right underneath it. So we have an air to water susceptibility boundary right there. And if we make a B0 map, that's just an image showing you the magnetic field in this particular slice, it might be three Tesla everywhere, but right above that little ball of air, you can see that the magnetic field is slightly higher. And if we take a slice a little bit lower, 
then again that ball of air in a nasal cavity makes the magnetic field here slightly lower. So that susceptibility boundary effect always occurs between air and uh, brain, but also between brain and skull, and skull and scalp. Now, what kind of effect do these uh, susceptibility boundary induced in homogeneities have? Well, for imaging, actually, if you do spin echo imaging, it almost has almost no effect. You can see these are really nice images, despite the fact that there's a strong inhomogeneity right there. And that is because spin echo sequences refocus B0 inhomogeneity. So with those images, you're insensitive. But as we all know, we can't only do spin echo methods. We sometimes have to do gradient echo methods. And you can see a gradient echo sequence. You have signal dropout. You lose signal right where the inhomogeneity is. In the lower slides also, where the auditory tracks are, you lose signal as well. And if you do ultra-fast imaging, like EPI, in addition to the signal loss, you also get image distortion, where you're going to get signal at positions where you know, it's outside the brain, so there shouldn't be any signal. So this is the effect for imaging. This is, of course, about MRS, this workshop. So what about MRS? Well, it's a little bit more subtle, perhaps. But let's say that we acquire a signal from this volume in the back of the brain. If we look at the B0 map, you can see there's a fairly nice homogeneous area of the brain. So if you acquire the water, it has a quite narrow line shape. And if you suppress that water, you get a pretty decent looking NMR spectrum. Now what now if we acquire the spectrum from the front that is right above that little nasal cavity ball of air, the magnetic field is highly disturbed and indeed the water is much broader and it is also shifted because it is not on resonance anymore. So if you could suppress this water, which you can, but if you could do it, you could get a spectrum that looks like this, very broad, very smeared out. So you can already see qualitatively that if you have a poor shim, if you have a poor magnetic field in homogeneity, homogeneity you're going to get your signals smeared out and you're going to have a hard time separating signals that are close to each other, like choline and creatine. Now, you can also simulate this in a little bit more a quantitative manner. Even for a single resonance here, I'm going to increase the line width and then we're going to look at the error in determining in determining the amplitude of this signal. So in this case, with this signal to noise and this line width, we have a 2.5% error in estimating its amplitude. If we now make the line width wider and wider and wider and wider, you can see that the error in estimating its amplitude goes up. And that is a well-known relationship that the error is directly proportional to the square root of the line width. If we now have two signals, two singlets, that are you know, partially overlapping, and we again increase the line width, you can see the error also goes up, but it goes up much faster. And this is because the error is again proportional to the square root of the line width times an overlap term. So what this tells you is, is that improved homogeneity leads to a higher accurate estimates of you know, the concentrations, and it leads to a better ability to separate overlapping signals. So both very important features for spectroscopy, of course. Now, what are we going to do about this? We know now we have inhomogeneity, we know it, what it's caused by. How are we going to solve this? Now, the way to solve it is, is, of course, called shimming. And shimming you can define as to maximize the homogeneity of your magnetic field by adding additional magnetic fields that cancel the magnetic field inhomogeneity in your sample. Mathematically, you can uh, see it as this. You have a certain I observed inhomogeneity in the human brain, for example, a function of position x, y, and z. And then you add additional magnetic fields, f, scaled with a certain amplitude, so that if you subtract these additional magnetic fields from the inhomogeneity, you get a perfectly homogeneous magnetic field. Now, then, of course, the question becomes, what are these additional fields supposed to look like, these f? Well, there's a, a number of ways to go about it. The classical way would be to use theoretical considerations. You want to have orthogonal fields. You want to have a complete basis set. You want to also be able to build it because a magnet is typically a cylindrical tube. So these coils would have to be in there. The coils that generate these functions would have to be fitting in there. You need to be able to construct it. So using these kind of arguments, fields based on spherical harmonic functions become a very nice natural candidate. And that was described in this paper from Romeo and Holt. Now, how do these fields look like? Well, we're all familiar with first order spherical harmonics. They're just the linear x, y, and z 
um, uh, terms. These are the coils that you use to generate them. So you just run a DC current through this. And this is then the field in the generator. So a nice linear X, a nice linear Y, and a linear Z, which goes into the plane. So you can see that in this, in this particular plane. But for shimming, we also use higher order spherical harmonic functions. And there are five second order terms. These are the coils that you have to make to generate these fields. And then these are the shapes of the, of the field in this particular plane. You can see that they're more complicated, they're higher order. And then there are seven third order, nine fourth order, etc. But typically you run out of space. You might, your bore is only so big, you can only fit so many coils in. So typically up to second or third order, that's about all you can fit in. This is how uh, the first orders typically look like because they're your gradients. So they're heavy duty, you know, like copper plating. They're optimized for linearity and strength. They use high current and high voltage because you want to make uh, images with it and they're actively shielded. So eddy current is typically not too much of a problem. These are the shim coils, the higher order shim coils. You can see they're much flimsier. They're typically, you know, like pasted on to the side of the of the tube, they are optimized typically for purity, but they, uh, they are run with low current and low voltage, and they're typically not actively shielded, and that will become an issue if you start to pulse them. I'll briefly mention that later. Okay, so now we have the, the, the theory, we have the, the hardware to do it. The next thing we need is we need to be able to measure quantitatively what the inhomogeneity in the subject is, so that we can you know, like compensate that. So you need to be able to measure the magnetic field distribution inside the subject, and you need to measure the magnetic field produced by all of these shim coils. Now, the standard way of doing that is B0 mapping, and that relies on the fact that the phase of your NMR signal is proportional to the B0 field at that position times the time it was in the XY plane. So the stronger the inhomogeneity is, the larger the B0 offset is, and therefore the stronger the phase is. Now, there's two general ways of doing that. Well, actually, one general way, which is like MRI-based B0 mapping. And for MRS, there's also a very nice uh, you know, like projection-based method. And I'll, I'll briefly discuss both of, both of those. The principle is as follows. Any sequence where you, you excite your magnetization, then the magnetization spends some time in the XY plane, and then you acquire it. For a sequence like this, the phase of this signal is proportional to, again, the B0 offset times the time it, it, it's, it's spent in the XY plane, which in this case is the echo time. But there are also a whole bunch of other phases, an RF phase, there could be eddy currents, there could be you know, like timing errors. You're not interested in these other phases, so, but it makes it difficult to calculate B0 from this phase if the other phases are around. So that's why you always need to do a second experiment where you increase the echo time slightly and you hope that the other phase terms are identical. If that is indeed the case, then you subtract the two experiments from each other, the other phases cancel out, and you can calculate the B0 term from the phase difference divided by the, the delta echo time. Now, if you do that, you can you get a B0 image like this. Uh, you can see that it looks decent, but it looks kind of noisy. And that is because this little increment between this echo time and this echo, echo time was small. So the phases don't have a lot of time to, uh, uh, to accumulate. They can only accumulate over a very small angle, and therefore the error will be quite large. So the way to solve that, of course, would be to go to a longer delta TE uh, 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 difference between echo time. And you can see, indeed, you greatly increase your signal to noise in this image. But there is a funky artifact here where you go from a very high positive value to a very low negative value. That cannot be realistic. That cannot happen like that. And that is purely an artifact because phase is only defined between minus pi and plus pi. So basically the phase jumps here from plus pi to minus pi and that is an artifact. You could use spatial unwrapping algorithms but you could also basically uh, acquire multiple echo times and then use a simple 1D phase unwrapping. No matter how you do it, you can end up with very high quality, high cycle to noise B0 maps. Now, that is, uh, a lot of people use that, but B0 mapping isn't always necessary or even desirable. If you have a very small volume, then there might not be enough you know, like pixels in your, B, in your MRI based B0 map to actually do a proper calculation. And then, you, of course, you can acquire a, a higher resolution B0 map, but that's very time consuming. So, if you're interested in a small voxel, 
single voxel MRS, then the fast map method is a very good alternative. And let me show you briefly what it's based on. So let's say that we want to acquire a signal from this volume. Let's zoom that in a little bit. What you do with fast map is you acquire essentially a 1D image. You, 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 you make a, a 1D projection, a column, and then you get a one-dimensional image. And this is then with one echo time. And then if you do a second echo time, with a, which is slightly longer, then you have additional phase accumulation because of the inhomogeneity. Calculating the difference between the two gives you your frequency profile. Now, from this you can determine, hey, there must at least be an x squared component in it because this is an x direction profile and there's clearly a second order function in there. Unfortunately, both the Z2 shim as well as the x squared minus y squared shim have an x squared component in it. So you cannot separate those two based on one profile. Because of that, you need to do at least six unique projections to characterize all your first and second order spherical harmonic shims. Now, let's say we have we have our B0 map. Let's, let's go with the MRI-based B0 map. The next thing you need to do is you need to determine which shims do I need to cancel the inhomogeneity that I see in this slice? Well, the, the most important thing, in my opinion, is you got to eliminate bad data. In this particular case, bad data is, for instance, this pixel right here, which is completely unrealistic. It's the sagittal sinus in your brain. Also, the pixels in the skull, you're not interested in them, and they give um, wrong values. So you need to draw an ROI, ROI to eliminate bad data. I think, in my opinion, that's the most crucial step. Now, once you have done that, then it's just a simple matter of approximating the experimental data as a linear sum of all the shim fields generated by all of the shim coils properly scaled by its own amplitude. In other words, in a least square manner, you need to solve for these amplitudes so that the sum of all of those equals that one. Now, if you do that and you subtract it from your B0, uh, from your in vivo inhomogeneity, then you end up with a shimmed B0 map. Now let's see, let's see how that looks like if we do that for real. So this is again the two slice data set. If you don't do any shimming, your inhomogeneity is terrible. Then you remove your first order spherical harmonic shims uh, inhomogeneity and it already looks much better. You, you then also in addition remove the second order as well and in addition, you remove the third order as well. And you can see that you know, in the back of the brain, the homogeneity is quite nice. But still in front and also in, in lower slices, you still have quite strong inhomogeneity. And that is because when you analyze it over the entire brain, the, the inhomogeneity is characterized by a very high order spherical harmonic functions, more than sixth order. And we don't have that. We don't have the space to get those kind of spherical harmonics in our uh, magnet. How about spectroscopy, single voxel spectroscopy? Let's say we look at this volume over here. If we don't do any shimming and require our water, it looks, well, not great, because you still have some inhomogeneity. But then if you remove the first order spherical harmonics, you can see that the line already narrows up quite nicely. If you then remove the second order as well, you, it, it narrows up quite even, even further. And removing the third order actually doesn't do anything anymore, because at this position in the brain, second order spherical harmonic shimming is plenty. How about in the front? Well, the starting homogeneity is much worse, because the inhomogeneity to begin with is much worse. Removing the, the first order uh, spherical harmonic terms indeed improves it, but not quite as drastic as in the back of the brain. Removing the second order as well improves it further, and, improve, and removing the third order improves it even further. But you never quite reach the same homogeneity as in the back of the brain. And that is just because the homogeneity is just that much worse in the front. But in general, I can say that for the majority of the brain, 80 or 90 percent of the brain, second order spherical harmonic, just simple static second order spherical harmonic shimming is adequate. Now, having said that, more often than not, I, I get students and they come to me with this question. You know, I did shimming, but the lines are still really broad. What's going on? Well, then there's, you, know, you can go through a little list of things that are potentially the problem. The number one reason, in, in my opinion, is always that you have bad data in your B0 mapping. There's bad pixels, for instance, from like a, a, like a blood vessel or from a low sickle to noise area or from lipids that compromise your data. And it can be a single pixel can throw off your mathematical fit completely. 
So the way to solve that is, is just to eliminate those bad pixels, redetermine your spherical harmonic shims, and then it should work. You can also have the situation that if you go for a very small volume, let's say a one by one by one centimeter, and your B0 map has a five millimeter resolution, you're only gonna have eight pixels across your MRS vo voxel. That's not sufficient to like, determine second and third order spherical harmonic shims. So you got a shim over a slightly larger region. Um, it could be that your inhomogeneity is just beyond the capability of your shim coils, that they're all maxed out at 100%, and you cannot improve it any further. What you can do then is either try to decrease your volume size or change the position slightly, if that's an option, then that can sometimes help, but you know, this is just a fundamental limitation. You can also have that your spherical harmonic shim coils are incorrectly calibrated. The, the short-term solution is to run a second iteration, acquire a second B0 map after you apply the first shims, run a second iteration that will solve it for you. The long-term solution would of course be to recalibrate your spherical harmonic shim system. Eddy currents, you could have a perfect homogeneity, so you, sh you did a really good job on your shimming, but the eddy currents of your MRS sequence make it look like the shimming is bad. You're going to have a, a broad line, but that has nothing to do with shimming. It's just purely eddy currents. Now, what you can do here is you could do an iterative or a manual first-order spherical harmonic shim to kind of shim out long time constant eddy currents. Um, it works, it, it, it can work really well, but it can also do nothing. It, it really depends on the situation. B0 eddy currents, that's a different type. You can take those out after you're done with your scan. And finally, you have to, have to realize that in, in certain you know, tissues like muscle, water just has a very short T2 relaxation time constant. So a line width of 30 hertz for the water is totally fine in muscle because you cannot theoretically get it any better than that. Um, how, how am I doing on time? Am I, do I have three minutes? Or have I, uh, three minutes. Okay, then I, I think I'm going to skip this part. It's going to take a little bit too long otherwise. And I'm going to go to basically the final uh, one is, so basically for local shimming, for single voxel spectroscopy, as I mentioned before, a static um, 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 spherical harmonic shimming is adequate for the majority of the brain. But how about if you want to do um, whole brain or whole slab spectroscopic imaging? You need to get that homogeneity everywhere at the same time. And as I showed you before, you cannot do that with low order spherical harmonic shims. Now, because of that, there have been many solutions trying to deal with the whole brain problem, trying to get homogeneity across the entire brain. You can have local shim coils, you can have local passive shim coils, you can have adaptive current networks, you can have multi-coil shimming. This has initially been described at Yale, and it has recently you know, been picked up by quite an, uh, a few groups, so I would like to spend a few more minutes on, on uh, detailing uh, uh, it. The principle is actually extremely simple. You just need a, a, a generic circular DC coil where you just run a, a DC current through. And if you do that, this is the coil here. If you run a DC current through this coil, it's a circular coil, you basically generate a very complicated magnetic field already. It has very high order terms in it, but also very low order terms. So you get all the benefits from higher order spherical harmonic shim coils, but also there's low order terms in there as well. Now, if you now make a whole bunch of these coils, 24, 36, or 48, and each of them is attached to a, an amplifier, an independent controller and an independent amplifier. Then, if you then put current in each of these coils, they can generate really crazy magnetic fields that you couldn't generate with spherical harmonic shims, at least not with lower order ones, like this one. Or like this one, if I change the combination of currents, and this actually kind of looks a little bit like the inhomogeneity that you have in the human brain, uh, some, some, some circle up front and then homo homogeneous somewhere else. But if you adjust the current really, really carefully, you can also make a perfectly linear field as well. So a system like this offers great, great flexibility in shaping your magnetic field. Now we've implemented this to shim the human brain at seven Tesla. We use 48 coils, you know, like distributed like this. This is basically how it was constructed. Simple hand wound DC coils, uh, put it in the RF coil, and then these are the results. So the, the upper one is if you have no shims. This one is if you do static third order spherical harmonic shimming, which is already kind of more than what most people have. And you can see that you have the artifact 
uh, in, the, in the frontal cortex and also in lower slices. I haven't discussed this, so just ignore this. And this is then if we do the multi core shimming. And you can see it is very green, basically indicating it is very, very homogeneous. And it is certainly a great improvement over the standard spherical harmonic shimming. It also works well on different subjects. You can see this is again standard shimming. Again, you have this frontal inhomogeneity. And multi core shimming is the bottom one. It greatly improved it. So to wrap up, um, I, I hope I've been able to show you that uh, magnetic field homogeneity is a key factor for uh, spectral quality, the accuracy for quantification, and the ability to separate overlapping resonances. And in my opinion, it, it is the key factor. Magnetic field inhomogeneity is caused primarily by air tissue susceptibility, and that is the one that we're dealing with on an everyday basis. It changes from subject to subject, and therefore you have to adjust it on a subject by subject basis. For most of the brain, if you do small uh, volumes, static second order shimming is, is adequate. Certain areas like the front, maybe some deeper structures you can use from higher order spherical harmonic shims. But if you want to do whole brain or whole slab, you just cannot get adequate homogeneity with low order spherical harmonic shimming. And then you need to use some of the alternatives, like very high order spherical harmonic shimming, dynamic shimming, that's the one that I skipped over, and also the multi coil based shimming, which is, of, of course, my favorite. Uh, but they all do a pretty nice job. So finally, I would like to thank my colleagues at Yale. Uh, Christoph Juchem did a lot of the multi coil work. Uh, Terry Nixon is our engineer who built most of the hardware that I uh, showed you. And I would like to thank NIH for the funding and you for your attention. <laughs>